So, <laughs> my wife's always Baruch Hashem, she's late. Um, so we're, we're continuing this book, Otsu Dinim, the Yishal We're skipping ahead to the three weeks. We have coming up from Sunday, the three weeks. So I thought we'd do some halachot on the three weeks. Right? Everybody is obligated to fast the four fasts. Right? There's obviously Yom Kippur, which is from the Torah. And there's the Shabbat. Those two fasts are, you know, no matter who, what, where, why, when, pretty much we insist you fast. The other fasts of Tanit Esther, of Shvasa Tammuz, of Tzom Gedaya and Asara Beteret were much more lenient. So, especially this year, even on, Yom, on Tisha B'Av, because really Tisha B'Av is on Friday night and it's Nidche, we're definitely a lot more lenient. I have ADD, I'll just throw it out there because it's a nice idea. The Chida, he says, the two big fasts are Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av. If Yom Kippur falls out on Shabbat, what do we do? You fast. You fast. Yom Kippur, you fast. Even on Shabbat. It says if Tisha B'Av falls out on Shabbat as it does this year, what do we do? Yes. You don't fast. It says the Chida, why is that? So I would have thought there's one's in the Torah and one's from the rabbis. It says the Chida, that's not why. He says every single tear that you cry on Tisha B'Av, that is a brick in the Bet HaMikdash. If I said to you, we're building the Bet HaMikdash, and you can put a brick, and there's going to be a plaque donated by 2022. How much would you pay for that? <laughs> right? You'd empty out your bank account. In the bed, I could donate a brick with a plaque. It's worth all the money in the world. It's going to be there forever. And Moshe Rabbeinu is going to dive in there. And Avraham Avinu and Sarah Imenu. And Rivka, Rachel. Are you kidding me? Says the Chida, every tear that you cry into Shabbat is literally building a brick in the Beit HaMikdash. And you're not allowed to build on Shabbat. You're not allowed to build on Shabbat. So if the Shabbat falls out on Shabbat, it has to be pushed off to Sunday. Yom Kippur, you fast. But the Shabbat, you're not allowed to build, which is not just, it's a nice concept. Oh, cry on the Shabbat. And maybe next week we can discuss what are we really mourning over, how do we cry. But the three weeks starts, Shvasa bet Tammuz, everybody's obligated to fast. Again, unless you have a woman who is pregnant, pregnant women are not obligated to fast. If you have a woman who's nursing, uh, again, this is for Shema Sabah Tammuz, not for Yom for the Shabbat. Right? A woman who's nursing, and according to this Faradim, and he goes through over here, he says even a woman who had a child in the past two years that's using formula that's not even nursing, still her body's getting back to herself, and therefore we're more lenient when it comes to Shema Sabah Tammuz. Right? If you have a woman, obviously, who's throwing up, who's not feeling well, whoever it might be, then for sure, you know, if she has morning sickness or... My wife was pregnant with my oldest. I don't know why they called it morning sickness. It was like all day, every day sickness. Baruch Hashem. But <laughs> each, each pregnancy is different though. <laughs> but, right? He says the Ashkenaz women also, as far as he understands, says uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, the son of Chacham Avadia, the current chief rabbi, says Ashkenaz women also, if they're pregnant on Shabbat Sabbat Tammuz, as far as he understands, they wouldn't have to. And like we said, a nursing mom also, if a woman had a miscarriage, it's all in the same boat, all in the same concept. And they would not have to fast on Shabbat Tammuz. So they can eat like normal? So he says you shouldn't be having a feast. Yeah. Right? You don't go to bread and invite all your friends and put pictures on Insta and whatever it might be. If that's what you do. <laughs> he doesn't say that exactly. But he says it shouldn't be like a feast. But yeah, if you need to eat, you can eat. It's, it's not a problem. I wouldn't necessarily do it in front of someone who is fasting. But at the same time, yeah, it's not a, it's not a problem. You don't have to only, like, on Yom Kippur or to Shabbat, if, which we're not discussing now, somebody has to eat or drink, they're supposed to do it in small increments, it's supposed to be done very modestly, etc., etc. Over here, Shabbat Sabbat Tammuz is not like that at all. Oh, my kid, I don't know. We're more, we're more lenient. Yeah, it's okay. They're giving us their input. Um, he says, interestingly enough, for a woman to get a haircut, which, again, I don't know how often women are getting haircuts, but for a woman to get a haircut during the three weeks, he says, would not necessarily be a problem. He goes to on the bottom, we won't get into it, what's considered, you know, even a woman who's sitting Shiva, right? When she gets up from Shiva, she doesn't necessarily have to wait the 30 days. Men is obviously different. Ashkenazim, from the beginning of the three weeks, if I'm not mistaken, already don't take haircuts and don't shave. Sfaradim, it's only Shavuah Shechalbo. This year, there is no Shavuah Shechalbo. Does that mean you literally have no Shavuah? Like there's no extra... There's no extra stringence. No, so there is the three weeks which is no music and no weddings. There is the nine days 
the nine no, so the nine days you don't have meat during that week of the nine days. Although some people happens to be they happen to have a lot of siyum yeah. 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 It just yeah. just just works out that way. It's unbelievable. I don't know how or why. It's just one of those things. But right? But if it's it's not about a siyum by the way. The nine days. It's not really a week on Everyone does all nine days. Again, you have Shabbat and that's how it works out. He discusses leftovers for kids, but this, this, this year anyways, I don't know how much, you know, again, for kids, leftovers, you don't want it to go to waste. You're able to. He says, if a woman is pregnant and she needs to have meat, we're more lenient. If a woman just had a baby and she needs to have meat and they need the strength, if you have even a, somebody who's sick and that's going to give them a lot of strength, then we're more lenient when it comes to the, to the meat. I right? personally... That's when I truly feel the loss of the Bet Amikdash is when, when there's no meat. That, that's what about swimming? So I don't know about the Ashkenazim. Sfaradim, it's only it's only Shavua Shachabu, right? It's, so the Sfaradim, it's only the week of Tisha B'Av, which this year there is no week of Tisha B'Av, right? and therefore it would be especially if the weather's like this. The, normally there's a concept. So let's say when it comes to laundry. So during the week of the Shabbat, the Shabbat, let's say next year, I don't know what day, it falls out on a Tuesday or a Thursday. So Sunday, Monday, or let's say on Thursday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're not supposed to do laundry. You're not supposed to wear freshly laundered clothes. The week of the Shabbat, there's different increments, right? There's the three weeks and the nine days, then the week of the Shabbat and then the Shabbat itself. This year, because the Shabbat falls out on a Saturday night on Motzei Shabbat, therefore there's no, that week that we normally we prepare ourselves even more for the Shabbat, doesn't exist. So the no... Um, won't have a laundry problem, no. Only the week of Tisha B'Av. Ashkenazim, the whole nine days. I remember seeing a clip, a video, Chacham Ovadia's. Some people have a custom, and especially in Israel, it's hot, that likes, some people have a custom that, that during the whole nine days, they don't take a shower. And Chacham he said, look at her face. <laughs> right? <laughs> Chacham Ovadia was like, very like, and again, especially in Israel, Chacham Avadia was very much like, we're not animals, that's disgusting, that's like, what are you, what are you thinking? You got to rinse off, you can't be, you know, we're human beings, you can't be sitting there, especially in Israel. And Israel, exactly, in Israel there's no Hebrew word for deodorant, right? It doesn't, they don't really, it doesn't exist so much. There's, there's no Hebrew, I was like, I went to the like, pharmacy, I'm like, I need deodorant, they're like, Mazze. I'm like, you know, tss. they're like, ma? <laughs> like, there's no Hebrew word for deodorant? I asked my cousin, he's like, endaval kazi, ma? Right? If you're going to be causing others to smell your body odor, for sure, you, you need to be taking a shower. But d- during the nine days, some people have a custom. But again, Shavuot, Shechalbo, that's not a problem this year of laundry. It's not a problem of swimming. Not anything that's the week of the Shabbat this year doesn't, doesn't apply. Maybe next week, if as the Shem, we have the class, we'll discuss the, the Tisha B'Av yes and no's. But now during the three weeks, so again, the custom is that you don't have music coming up from Sunday. You don't have weddings. Etc. Um, during the nine days, many people don't don't eat meat. From Sfaradim and Ashkenazim differ on this. Ashkenazim, even on Rosh Chodesh Av, they already that's the day they start the nine days. Sfaradim on Rosh Chodesh itself, they still excuse me, they still have meat because it's still Yom Tov. It's also the yard side of Arona Kohen that passed away in this past week's parasha. But the rest of the time, they wouldn't have the meat. He goes through, like we just said, the Shavuot Shechabo about washing clothes and which things do or don't apply during Shechabo. Shavuot Shechabo this year, it won't confuse you because there is no Shavuot Shechabo. Right? He talks about also changing seat, sheets and linen and all that type of stuff. During Shavuot Shechabo, you're not supposed to have freshly laundered clothing. Again, this year it doesn't apply, but many people, it just sort of applies for Sunday. On Sunday to Shabbat, you're not going to be wearing freshly laundered clothes. Make sure it's, you don't want to wear dirty clothes, but you put it on even for up to a half hour. And then already it's considered not freshly laundered. And therefore, you see some people, they put on like six outfits at once, walk around for a half hour and be like, all right, it's not freshly laundered anymore. If, if that fits that way. All right? I know some guy, they put on like a bunch. What's that? Some people stamp on it, stand on it. That way it's not freshly laundered. Um, the kids enjoy that one. Well, there's different customs to make sure that it's not freshly laundered. But... All right, and then he says, like we just said, on a year like this year, with the Shabbat falls out on Friday, excuse me, on a Friday night, which would be then pushed off to Sunday, it's um, it's not a problem to wash your clothes, to have fresh laundered stuff. And he says the Ashkenazim, they're machmir, they're machmir from Rosh Chodesh. It says some Edut Mizrach, some Sephardi places, they were machmir, like the Ashkenazim, but most most weren't. He says when it comes to even cleaning the house and cleaning the floors and stuff like that, 
Again, this year is not a problem, but Shavuot Shachabo, some people, they don't go out of their way. They should feel the loss of the Beit HaMidash, and things aren't perfect. Things aren't beautiful. Things aren't as clean as we'd like them to be. It says, on Friday, during the nine days, if you want to taste the Shabbat food, that's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. Many people's favorite mitzvah. is to taste the food on a Friday. And therefore, if you're doing it to taste it, that's fine. If you end up eating half the thing, that's not so fine. But if you're just doing it to taste, does it need some more spice? Yes, no. That wouldn't be a problem even on, um, on the Friday right before Tisha B'Av, during the Shavuot Shachabo. My mother-in-law, she loves that week because usually she has to make like two pots of everything. Because, you know, there's the Friday, the people that come and eat all the food, and then there's the food for Shabbat. But during the nine days, she just has to make one pot because nobody's allowed to eat the, the Shabbat food. Right? If you have a child that reached the age of chinu, so usually that's about six, seven, eight years old, and they understand the concept of the fact that there's no Bet Amigdash, etc., then we are able to insist that they too um, don't have meat and that they too don't go swimming, etc., etc., when it comes to things that have to do with the nine days in Shavuot Shechabu. Um, we want to make sure that they understand. I'll tell you a nice story before we get to the parasha. My son was maybe three and a half years old. And it was to Shabbat And he says, Abba, can I listen to Uncle Maishi? I said, no. He said, why not? So I figured it's a good opportunity. I'll, I'll teach him. I said, today's a very sad day. It's the Shabbat The bad people, they came and they broke Hashem's house. And that's why it's very sad. I figured I'll milk it. I said, that's why Abba and Mommy were fasting. We're not eating. And you have to behave extra good. We don't have so much energy. And he says, I also want to fast. And I said, well, when you get to be bar mitzvah, you fast. Now you're only three. He said, no, I'm fasting. I said, okay. I'm very proud of you that you're fasting. Run to the kitchen. Go to mommy. I said, you're fasting. And I'm very proud of you. And you can have a cookie. Right? And he goes, off. Oh, right. <laughs> After the fast, he sees us eating, breaking the fast. He comes to me. He says, Abba, sad day's over? I said, yeah. He said, I can listen to Uncle Maishi. I wasn't going to get into a way to Chatzot next day. I'm like, I said, yeah, yeah. He was about to go to sleep. I said, yeah. He got the big smile. He said, they fixed Hashem's house. I said, no, not yet. He said, so why is the sad day over? We'll have to have a class on that at a different time. <laughs> what exactly is the attitude right after the Shabbat? But this week's parasha, parashat Balak. And to some extent, it's a continuation from last week's parasha. At the end of last week's parasha, the Jewish people go to war versus Edom. Right? They wanted to just not have a war, but Edom was insisting. They then go to war versus Sichon Melech Ha'emori and Og Melech Habashan, these two giants. And they're able to defeat these two giants. Comes this week's parasha, Balak from Moab sends a messenger to Zikne Midian, to the elders of Midian. And they say, there's this nation that came out of Egypt, and they're at the precipice, they're about to come and conquer us. How do we destroy them? How do we destroy them? What, why, why are they sending a message to Midian? So our rabbis tell us, they weren't stupid. They looked and they said, you have these giants, Sichon and Ob. Everybody, they were the mafia. Everybody paid them protexia. Because nobody could defeat them. Come the Jewish people, and they defeat Sichon and Ob. And now they try and understand, obviously this isn't a physical battle. Physically, Sichon and Og and their armies are the most powerful. How are we meant to defeat the Jewish people? They went to the Zikne Midian. Why is it Zikne Midian? Moshe Rabbeinu is the prince of Egypt. When he leaves Egypt, where does he then go? Where is his wife from? Midian. So Moshe, excuse me, so Balak sends to the, they've been in the desert 40 years. I mentioned last year, 40 years jump. They've been in the desert 40 years. They now need to go to the elders of Midian. Remember Moshe Rabbeinu used to stay by you guys 50 years ago? 45 years ago? What's his strength? What's his power? How do we defeat this guy? And what do the people from Midian answer? What is the strength of the people and of the Jewish people in Moshe Rabbeinu? It's in our mouth. It's the koach adibor, the power of prayer. So they say we need to fight fire with fire. We say in the Shlosh Yisrael Karim, the 13 fundamentals, Lo kambi Yisrael ki Moshe od. There was never anybody as great as Moshe amongst the Jewish people. He is the Ava Nevi'im. He's the father of all prophets. They say, Lo kambi Yisrael ki Moshe. Nobody amongst the Jews was as great as Moshe. 
But there was somebody amongst the non-Jews. Who was that? Bilam. Moshe Rabbeinu is Av HaNevi'im. He's the father of all prophets. He speaks to God face to face, mouth to mouth. Every other prophet in a dream. How does Bilam talk to Hashem? Also, face to face, mouth to mouth. Now rabbis tell us, why is it that Bilam had this ability? Bilam was so great. Our rabbis tell us, no. When they discuss Bilam, they say, you read through the Psukim, maybe another class for another time. He's the most narcissistic, egotistical, self-centered person you'll find out there. <laughs> Based on the Psukim. Right? There's a Mishnah in Prakeh, it says, these three character traits, you're a student, mitamidav Avraham Avinu. And these three character traits, you're a student of Bilam. Again, another class for another time. He was very egotistical and self-centered. How could it be somebody on such a high level was such a bad person? And our rabbi said, because he didn't earn it. Moshe Rabbeinu earned it. Bilam was given it as a gift. That way the non-Jews aren't able to say, hey, if we would have had a Moshe Rabbeinu, you give us a prophet like Moses, we'd also be amazing. Right? No, 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 no. It's not about that. You also had a great prophet. And it's the... What's that? It's not so much like for like. The, the reality is it's not so much like for like. The ability is there. Imagine you have a kid who's a genius whose IQ is 200, another kid who's a genius IQ 200. And they say this kid, he figured out, you know, proving there's a God, and this kid figured out quantum physics, and this kid figured out how to, you know, cure every single illness out there because he uses IQ. And your kid did nothing. You'll be like, yeah, but, but they have the same IQ. That, <laughs> You either used it or you didn't. But the reality is, you can't complain. How come my kid didn't have the same possibilities as this kid? They're both geniuses. Hashem says, I gave them both equal opportunity. The question is, how they use it? Bilam used it the wrong way. Moshe Rabbeinu used it the right way. Bilam was narcissistic and Moshe Rabbeinu was the most humble. But Bilam's power was in his speech. Now Bilam, and we don't have, we're not going to go through every single thing, but Bilam tried over and over and over to curse the Jewish people. And then at the end of the parasha, which we'll focus on, he realizes he can't curse the Jewish people. How is Bil'am planning on destroying the Jewish people? The rabbis tell us there's one second of every day that Hashem gets upset. There's one second of every day that Hashem gets upset. Bil'am knew that second and he was going to tap into it. He was going to say one word, not even, kalem, destroy them. But that, that second didn't come. Hashem knew what Bil'am was planning to do and therefore it doesn't come. At the end of the parasha, Bil'am says, all right, if you want to take down the Jews, I have an idea. Elokei Yisrael sonez imra. The God of the Jews hates promiscuity, hates zinut, hates when guys and girls are hooking up. And therefore, he says, we'll send out the women to entice the Jewish people. Now, you have to understand, who were these people? What have they been doing all day, every day for the past 40 years? What have the men been doing? Were they planting and plowing? Working the fields? No. What were they doing all day, every day? Learning Torah. So you have a bunch of rabbis who for 40 years were in Kolel learning Torah all day, every day. <laughs> Not just were they learning all day, every day from Moshe Rabbeinu. <laughs> and now Bilam sends out these women to entice them. <laughs> How's that going to work? So I saw one rabbi say, and we'll get to another idea which is a bit more practical, but another, I saw one rabbi say, why does Hashem get upset for a second every day? Why does Hashem get upset? We're not going to get into the topic. Does Hashem have character traits? Does Hashem get upset? Does He get happy? Hashem gets upset. Hashem doesn't have happiness or getting upset or anger. But we use terminologies we can understand. Why does Hashem get upset? Because there has to be certain things in the Bria. Right Before I was here, I was learning with somebody. He said, I, don't, I can't get my head around the fact that this donkey spoke. How does a donkey talk? So I said... The Mishnah in Perkei Avot says, Hashem created certain things, Ben Mashot. Right before He finished creating the world. Everything within the realm of humanity, once Hashem creates the world, everything is within the realm of nature. If we had a video of the splitting of the sea, you wouldn't say it was a miracle. What would you say? Tsunami. The Pasuk says, Hashem hetil ruach kadim. God brought a northern wind. It looks like it was nature. You would say, Makat Choshech, eclipse. Everything that's out there was done within the realm of nature. Anything that was going to be miraculous, Hashem creates before the world's created. And therefore, the Piha Aton, the mouth of the donkey, was created before Hashem creates the world. Before God creates Adam and Chava, right before Shabbat, He creates 
the piah on the mouth of the donkey. Right? I said to somebody one time, you know how in the winter it's crazy pressure right before Shabbat? And what do you say? Shabbat's too short. Friday's too short. I can't wait for the summer. Sounds familiar? And then what happens in the summer? Is there still chaos? Yeah. <laughs> what happened? I get it. When Shabbat's at 3.30, okay. Shabbat is coming in at like 9 o'clock. Why is there still chaos? So it's in the creation. Even Hashem was creating stuff. Ben Hashemah short right before Sunday. <laughs> well, if Hashem was doing stuff, now you don't have to feel bad, right? If Hashem was, 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 was not, chas shalom, it's in the creation that this Hashem wants there to be in creation that there's anger. Because there's times you need to get angry. There's times you need to say, this is not right. You see something that's wrong, we need to tap into that anger and say, I need to stand up for what's right. Bilam sees that that anger is not there in creation right now. Hashem's not getting angry because he doesn't want Bilam to use it. So Balak says, and Bilam says, now we can entice the Jewish people. Because normally, if they saw a bunch of promiscuous women, what would happen? They'd be like, hey, this is wrong. This is wrong. What happens over here? They don't have that anger to tap into. And therefore, the women are somewhat able to entice the Jewish people. Now, our rabbis tell us what happened. When we started, we said, We started these classes, we said it's called Chok 2020, based on the concept of Chok Israel. There's a book called Chok Israel that has a little bit broken up by the parasha and by the day. Has a little bit of Chumash, a little bit of Gemara, a little bit of Navi, a little bit of Musa, a little bit of Kabbalah. So every once in a while we like to get a little bit Kabbalistic. So this week's parasha gives us the opportunity to get a little bit Kabbalistic. Bil'am sends out the women to entice the Jewish people. So our rabbis tell us, how did he do it? Bil'am understood the Yetzirah. If he just sends out random women to entice the Jewish people that are young and beautiful and good looking, then no way it's going to happen. So what did he do? He said, I'll, I'll wear them down. Right. Jewish people, their favorite word is sale or free. Right? The Jewish people, they're, they're, they're going shopping. They're in the marketplace. I, I have a degree in finance. Could be when I grow up, I'll make some money. Right? And I remember meeting with the dean of business and I wasn't sure, should I go for finance or should I go for marketing? And he said, which one do you like better? I said, marketing. He said, why? I said, everything in marketing is psychology. Whenever you see the word sale, what color is it? Red. Why? Because subconsciously, red is a stop sign. Red is a red light. If a woman wants to be bold, she wears red nail polish or red lipstick or red dress, right? It, 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 that's all psychology. When you have a shopping list and you want to buy stuff, so there's milk and there's nappies and there's bread. Does anybody write like Twix? Right? Chocolate? Mars? It's not usually on the list. They know that. So where do they put all the chocolate bars? Right, right by the ooh, impulse buy. Right? That's all psychology. What they do, how they do every single thing. The, I was talking to one of our rabbis, our new rabbi that we just hired. He's going to Poland this week. So I said to him, you know, I was on a Poland trip one time. And by Shabbat, we try and get three people to speak per meal. Not necessarily a Dvar Torah. I came here expecting this. I saw that. This now means this to me, right? All different types of things. So I was on a trip and this other staff member, he comes back. I said, we need three people per meal. He, I said, we need at least nine speakers. He comes back. He says, I asked every student. Only two want to speak. I said, all right, give me a minute. I come back two minutes later. I said, sorted. He said, I, could, I asked every single... I said, you asked them if they want to speak? He said, yeah. I said, I asked them, fella, are you speaking Friday night or Shabbat day? <laughs> no? Okay, Sudash so Lishi. If you don't give them an, a choice, it depends. How, that's all psychology. That's all marketing. That's all... Depends how you ask the question. That, that, that's all what it comes down to. So, Bil'am... Knows the Jewish people like a good sale. They're like free. So he has these people. And the Jewish people, they're traveling. And they see sale. And the woman outside, very tzanua, 95 years old, bulletproof Rebetzin. She says, come, come, come. We have a Lexus camel, only 20 grand. The regular price, 40 grand. I know. In my company over here, there's a contest. And whoever sells the most gets a free trip to Tahiti. I really want to go. Come, I'll give you a good deal. Okay. 20 grand, Lexus, sounds good. Sits down over there and she says, can I get you a drink? She takes out a bottle of wine. He says, no, no, I can't, I can't drink your wine. I'm really sorry. He says, no, 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 this is special wine. I remember I was in, uh, Rabbi Tugentov Shul 
and this guy was there from Israel, he was collecting money, and he says, whoever donates 100 pounds, we have a special bottle of wine they get from Reb Chaim Kanievsky. This is Reb Chaim Kanievsky wine. Right, what happens? Every year Reb Chaim Kanievsky, Zechronel Reb made a few matchas, and he would, you know, make a hagefen, they take that wine, and they'd pour that wine into like every bottle, or into one bottle, and, that bottle, and this is special wine from Reb Chaim Kanievsky. I said, you know what? For 100, 100 quid, sounds like a good deal. Right? I didn't realize that they didn't like put it in the vat and make a special thing. They opened each bottle. So by the time I used it two years later, the wine was like way off. <laughs> but okay. Right? This isn't any wine. This is Rechaim Kanevsky wine. The lady says to the Jewish people in the desert, this isn't any wine. This is Moshe Rabbeinu wine. Special has a Heksha of Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay. He's sitting there. She says, I'm going to go file the paperwork. What happens? A few minutes later, walks by another woman. Now she's not in her 90s. She's in her 40s. And she's dressed a little bit less modestly. And she says, so, what are you buying? She says, I'm getting a Lexus Camel, 20 grand. Crazy, she says. I'll get it for you, 18 grand. What? How? I want to win the contest. Are you sure? Yeah, just promise me you're not going to tell anybody. Come to my office. He comes to the office, she says, wine? She says, uh, should I buy any wine? He has another cup of wine. He's drinking, he's waiting, he's... It's going to show all his friends. Right? People don't get a deal because they want to get a deal. They want to get a deal so they can tell their friends. Do you know how much I bought these shoes for? Yeah? Do you know how much this was? It's, it, you feel good? Walks by another woman. She's 20 years old. She's wearing nothing. And she says, Come, I'll sell it to you 15 grand. I'll throw in the new iPhone. 15 grand. He comes over there. She says, Can I get you some wine? She says, This is the best day ever. All right? He has some more wine. He says, excuse me, is there a toilet? Can I use the toilet? What does she say? He says, if you want, over here we have our Abu Dazara, our idol. You know, anyways, I got to go do some paperwork. You can do your business on the idol. The guy says, this is an amazing day. I get to defile the Abu Dazara. I get to get a Lexus. I get to get a camel. I get to have the iPhone for a steal of a deal. Unbelievable. She comes back. She says, wow. That's unbelievable. Nobody's worshipped the Avodah Zarah like that. She says, what do you mean worship? She says, that's how we worship our Avodah Zarah. <laughs> we go to the toilet. It's called Baal Paor. The guy says, I can't believe it. 40 years in the desert. All I do all day, every day is learn Torah from Moshe Rabbeinu. And now I just worship the Avodah Zarah. The guy gets depressed. The woman's barely wearing anything. He's had a bunch of cups of wine. And before you know it, the guy's giving into the temptation. And this happened over and over and over to a bunch of different people. Bilam understood. We'll send out the women. Now, at the end of this week's parasha, it tells us a story. You have the head of the tribe of Shimon, called Zimri ben Salu, and there's a, a princess called Kozbi Batsur. Her father is Sur Kozbi. Now, I saw it in the Peleuet, the Midrash brings down, that she says, I'm looking for Moshe Rabbeinu. Can anybody point out to me who is Moshe Rabbeinu? My father sent me here to entice him comes the head of the tribe of Shimon, very elderly man. And he says, you come with me. She says, I'm looking for Moshe Rabbeinu. My father sent me here. What does she say? She says, what does he say? Shimon is older than Levi. Moshe Rabbeinu is from the tribe of Levi. I'm from the tribe of Shimon. You come, you be with me. She goes into the tent. She's being with the head of the tribe of Shimon, Zimri ben Salu. Pinechas makes it like he wants to get in there because he also wants to turn. And what happens? He takes out a spear and he kills them in the act. There was a plague. What's the last pasuk of this week's parasha? How many people died in the plague? 24,000. That's the end of this week's parasha. 24,000 people die in this plague. Pinechas, by killing Kozbi and Zimri, that stops the plague. Our rabbis tell us, you have next week's parasha, parasha Pinechas, Hashem says, I give him Bereti Shalom. And then the end, or in the, in the middle of Parashat Matot, you have that God commands Moshe Rabbeinu, go avenge the people that died in the plague. Go have a war with Midian. And our rabbis tell us, just put it all in one parasha. It should be in one parasha. Pinechas kills Kozbi and Zimri. The Jews go to war and they avenge the people that died in the plague. The people that died because they were promiscuous. So we're going to get a little bit Kabbalistic. There's a rabbi called the Ramami Pano. 
I have this book in my house. It's called Gilgulei Neshamo Daramami Panu. Reincarnation. It's all about who is a reincarnation of who. And he says, who was this woman, Kozbi Batsur? He says, just look at her name. Kozbi stands for, Chaf is Kozbi. Zion stands for Zu. Bet stands for Bat. And Yud stands for Yiftach. Kozbi, Zu, Bat, Yiftach. Anybody ever heard of Yiftach? Who's Yiftach? Not Yitro, Yiftach. It's in the Navi. Right? Anybody heard of Yiftach? You heard of him. <laughs> Nobody nowadays is, met, is called Yiftach, so, so if you don't know anything about it, right? We were sitting. But he was not a Talmud Chacham. Not necessarily. No. We'll get back to him in a sec. Right? No. We were sitting around the Shabbat table last week, and my wife and I know if it's a boy or a girl, but we were like sitting there with the kids, and we were like picking names. They were like, I was like, you know who doesn't get named after? Nobody names after the Prophet Chabakuk. It's a boy, we should be Chabakuk, and if it's a girl, Chabakuka. <laughs> They were like, you can't do that. The kid will get beaten up. I'm like, it's a cool. It wouldn't be cool. It would like end up having a nickname because they can't even pronounce it. And it would probably be like Chewbacca. Right? And then the nickname would be like Chewy. My wife's like, we're not naming our kid Chewy. Right? And then they were like, oh, you know what? If it's a girl, we should do like Ocean. And I'm like, what's the Hebrew of Ocean? They're like, Yam. I'm like, we're not naming our kid Yam. <laughs> like, it's not a name. Right? We're going to Yiftach. Nobody names after Yiftach. You don't, you don't anybody name Yiftach? No, so nobody knows who he is, right? Yiftach is somebody who's going out to war. He ends up becoming the leader of the Jewish people, goes out to war, and he promises, once I say it, oh, the first thing that comes out of my barn, I will bring it as a sacrifice. He goes to war, comes back victorious, it's a miracle, and what comes out? His daughter. Says the Ramami Pano, who is this woman that Pinechas kills, Kozbi Batsur? Kozbi zu bat Yiftach. Kozbi comes back in her next reincarnation as the daughter of Yiftach. And our rabbis say, you see, there's certain similarities. Why is Tzur this princess? Why is she? Why is she going and doing this with the with the head of the tribe of Shimon, especially if he's older? He says, you know why? Because her father said so. My father commanded me. She has this kibud avaim inside of her. Yiftach. If I'm Yiftach's daughter and, and Yiftach says to me, I don't know how to tell you this, uh, but yeah, you're going to be a sacrifice. What would I say? Habibi, that's your problem, not mine. I didn't make the promise. Right? I didn't make... Okay. Yiftach's daughter listens to her, listens to him. And according to most opinions, she goes to live up in the mountains. A korban is considered hekdesh, is sanctified. And therefore, when a man gets married, what's the words he uses? Hare'at mikudesh li. She's already mikudah. She's already sanctified to Hashem. And her friends would come visit her a little bit, but otherwise, she was for Hashem. What sin did she do? Promiscuity. Physicality. Being with the man that she wasn't supposed to be with. What is her tikkun? What fixes her? Being with nobody. Right? And our rabbis tell us that really, Yiftach should have done hatarat nedarim. He could have taken away the promise. But what happened? He says, I'm the leader of the Jews. Let Pinechas come to me. He's the Kohen Gadol. Pinechas says, I'm the Kohen Gadol. He's the one that made a stupid promise. I don't know if he's so stupid, but yeah, if he wants, let him come to me. What ends up happening? Each one of them gets punished in their own way. But Pinechas, in a way, it was good that he doesn't take away the promise because what ends up happening? That's the tikkun for Bat Yiftach. Says that Amami Pano, who does this woman then come back as afterwards? She comes back as Izevel. You heard of Izevel? Who's Izevel married to? Achav. Right? And this terrible king and queen, they ran around killing prophets. Who was their arch enemy? Who did they want to kill the most? Eliyahu yeah. Anavi. I was at a Brit Milah yesterday. Svaradim liked to sing by a Brit Milah. Right? I said to a guy, I was trying to teach him. I said, you know why there's so much singing now? He said, why? I said, by the Ashkenazi, and they do the Brit Milah, and until they wrap it up, and da -da -da, the baby cries and cries and cries, and the mom, it's like breaking her heart. Right? By the Sfaradim, they just sing and sing and sing. Nobody could hear the baby cry. Right? I'm serious, that's why we say, right? You shouldn't feel bad. It makes sense. Nobody hears the baby cry. And then they do like the, the Lion King. You know how they do that nowadays? The lion. They wave the baby around. Izevel, her whole life, is trying to kill Eliyahu. And our rabbis tell us, Pinchas zu Eliyahu. Who's the reincarnation of Pinchas? Eliyahu Anavi. So without realizing it, 
You killed me, I'm going to try and kill you. Says the Ramami Pano, who does she come back as in the final Gilgul? Says Batsur. You know what Batsur stands for? Bechaya Tav'a Tzadik in her life. She's a desired Tzadik, Eshed Rufus. She's the wife of Rufus. What does that mean? She's the wife of Rufus. So in the Talmud, there's a Roman general called Tonus Rufus. And you have many times stories in the Gemara that Tonus Rufus is debating with Rabbi Akiva. Right? Uh, let's say we just mentioned Brit Mila. What Tornus Rufus comes to the Biakiva and says, Did God create a perfect world? The Biakiva understands that he's got an agenda. If the Biakiva says, Of course Hashem created a perfect world, what's Tornus Rufus going to say? So why are you uh, harming these innocent children by circumcising them? Hashem created a perfect world. They're perfect. What are you doing? The Biakiva, when, when asked by Tornus Rufus, Did God create a perfect world? What does he answer? He says, not everything's perfect. He gave us the opportunity in certain ways to partner with him to make the world perfect. There's a concept of tikkun olam. There's stories that Turnus Rufus comes to the Biakiva, says, show me your God. He says, come, I'll show you. Takes him outside on a day like today. He says, look up at the sun. He says, I can't. He says, you can't even look at one of God's creations you think you can look at God. Right? They'd have many debates, quite often in Colosseums, in front of people. One day, Tornus Rufus comes home and he's very distraught. His wife says, what happened? He says, again, I had a debate with Rabbi Akiva and he embarrassed me. He beat me. She says, well, what can I do to help you? Tornus Rufus says, Elokei Yisrael I know the God of the Jews hates promiscuity, hates zinut. You're a beautiful woman. Would you be willing to go and try and entice Rabbi Akiva? Because if he's with you, then God will be upset at him and he won't be able to defeat me. She says, I'll do anything for you, my dear husband. She goes and she dresses very provocatively and she comes to Rabbi Akiva. Says the Gemara, Rabbi Akiva sees her from far. He looks away, he spits, he laughs and he cries. He spits because he's disgusted by the way she's dressed. He laughs because he sees that he's destined to marry this woman. And he cries because he sees how she's destined to die. Says the Gemara, she can't believe it. That this, this man was able to not give in to temptation. She's known as one of the most beautiful women. And she goes and she comes to him a little while later dressed up properly. And she says, I'm so amazed. I want to study your, your Bible, your Torah. He sees that she's eventually meant to convert and marry him. And it looks pretty sketchy if he converts her and then he marries her. <laughs> that doesn't look right. He says, go speak to the rabbis. She ends up converting and she ends up marrying him. The Gemara says that Tornus Rufus comes to this woman that he used to be married to. Now married to the Akiva and says, look, your husband Akiva, it's just a matter of time. We know that he's teaching Torah in public and the law is if you teach Torah in public, you're going to get killed. If you're willing to come back to me, I'll make sure he doesn't get harmed. But if not, then not only will he die, but you'll die because I know that you're his accomplice. And you're enabling him to teach Torah in public. She says, you think I can come back to you? After having such holiness and seeing what a real man is supposed to look like. What a holy man is, you think I can come back to you? I'm really sorry, there's no way. And he ends up killing her. Right? That's why Biakiva cried. Who is this woman, Kozbi Batsur? She has this unbelievable of, level of Kibud Avayim. She comes back as Bat Iftah. Part of her Tikkun is to be... Celibate and to not be with any other man, to be Hektesh, to be Kadosh. She comes back as Izevel trying to kill Eliyahu. And she comes back as Bechaya Tavat Sadiq, that's Bat, and then Tsur is Tsur is Sadiq, Ve'eshed Rufus, she was the wife of Rufus. Says the Ramami Pano, that's who she comes back as. Says, Who is Zimri ben Salu? Who does he come back as? Our rabbis tell us quite shockingly, you know who he comes back as? Rabbi Akiva. He comes back as Rabbi Akiva. Why? What was the last pasuk in this week's parasha? How many people died in the plague? 24,000. How many students Rabbi Akiva had? 24,000. It wasn't that Rabbi Akiva, that Zimri, saw this beautiful woman and said, I got to be with her. He saw that our Nisham was intertwined. I meant to, I'm destined to marry this woman. He didn't realize it's supposed to be in, <laughs> in another lifetime. And the next Gilgul. 
our rabbis tell us who was this man, Zimri ben Salu. So in Jewish history, you have Dina. Dina goes out and she gets raped and she gets pregnant. According to many opinions, she has a child, but this child doesn't know which tribe he fits into. He ends up being in which tribe? He ends up being that Shimon. Shimon and Levi are the two brothers that say, Dina, we got you back. And what happens? Shimon says, you'll be part of our tribe. And ends up living very long. And he ends up being very holy and ends up becoming the head of the tribe. Otherwise known as Shulumi El Ben Suri Shaddai or Zimri Ben Salu. Our rabbis tell us that who does Zimri come back as? None other than Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva. Now, if I was to ask you, Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara says that when he's being killed, how do they kill Rabbi Akiva? They take hot combs and they comb off his skin. And Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara says, what's he doing at that time? That's a different one. There's the Asara Haruge Machut, the 10 different martyrs. A different one of the 10 martyrs was wrapped in the Sefer Torah and they put the gvil and they put cotton to make it last longer. And he said, I see the letters flying. That's uh, Yossi ben Trodion. I forgot which one of the Asara Haruge Machut. Ishmael Kohen Gadol. Rabbi Akiva was the third of the Asara Haruge Machut. They take hard combs and they peel off his skin. And our rabbi, the Gemara says, he's, he's, he's smiling. And they say, how could you pass... He says, Kol I've, I've, I've always been waiting to say Shema. Because we say in the Shema, Ve'hafta d'ashem me'okecha b'chol levavecha b'chol nafshecha. Serve Hashem with all your heart, all your soul. And I never had this opportunity. Now finally, Kol Yamai, all my days, I've been waiting to do this. To say Shema and make a Kiddush Hashem. Our rabbis tell us, we have five senses. Kozbi and Zimri, Obviously, to some extent, they used all the senses. But which sense between sight, speech, smell, hearing, and touch, which sense did they use when they were together? I would have said touch. The Gemara says, when Rabbi Akiva is being combed alive, skinned alive, the angels come and say, Zu Torah, v'zu this is the reward? This is Torah, this is the reward? How can it be? And Hashem says, this is what's meant to be. Don't make me bring the world back to Tov, Avol. Either be quiet, I'll bring the world back to Tov Vavo. So it says the Dubna Magir, a beautiful mashal. What does it mean, I'll bring the world back to Tov Vavo? It doesn't mean I'll destroy the world. He gives a mashal in a parable that you might have heard. It says you have this king. I like to use the example of kings. Because it's not very applicable nowadays. I usually make it CEOs of big companies, right? You have this Saudi Arabian prince. And people like to bring in gifts. And one guy says, your, your Highness, this fabric is the most rare fabric in the world. It's woven with 24 karat gold together with this rare type of thing that you only find on this animal that's basically extinct. It's the most precious, beautiful material in the world. And I brought you a few yards of it. The king sees it and it's just, it's stunning. It's magnificent. He calls over his tailor and he says to his tailor, I want you to make me an outfit out of this. We're going to throw a big parade. I'm going to wear this outfit. I'll have pictures of me drawn in this outfit. It's going to be magnificent. But every inch is priceless. Don't throw away any of the scraps. Okay. Instead of two, three weeks, the tailor normally makes an outfit, a suit for the king. It takes him three months. He calls the king. He says, it's ready. He says to the king, you're going to look amazing. It's perfect. The king says, okay. He tries it on. He's never looked so handsome. He says, where's the scraps? Where's the extra pieces of material? He says, your highness, there were no scraps. I used every last inch. Okay. The king is talking to the other ministers and other people, and they don't like this tailor. They don't like him. And they say, your highness, where's the scraps? The king says, they told me there is no scraps. Says, How can you cut a piece of material? It's, no, it's impossible. He must be that he took it for himself. He stole from your, your highness. Treason, you should kill him. So he calls in the tailor. He says, where are the scraps? The tailor says, I told you, Highness, there's no scraps. He says, I'm going to have to kill you. It's not possible. He says, Your Highness, I can show you where every last piece of material is. But to do that, what do I have to do? I have to unravel the whole suit. He says, go ahead. He unravels every single... He stitched over here and folded this and tied it down. And he eventually unravels the whole suit and you see every last piece of material. When Hashem says to the angels... 
when they're crying, how could Rabbi Akiva die such a death? What does he say? Either be quiet, I'll return the world to the beginning. What does that mean? I'll have to unravel the whole suit. I'll have to unravel time and take it all the way back to Adam and Chava. And then you'll see every single person that suffered and the way they suffered and the punishment that they got or the wealth that they got or the success that they had was exactly measure for measure what they were meant to get. I, you'll have to unravel the suit. I'll have to I'll have to return the world to before it was created so that the whole the pieces fit. But everything makes perfect sense. Rabbi Akiva, when he's Zimri, which sense is he using? Touch. What's the tikkun for him being promiscuous and using that sense of touch? What has to happen? They have to comb his skin off. What does it mean? Kol my all my days. Since I made that Chilul Hashem when I was Zimri, I've been waiting to make a Kiddush Hashem and to say Shema Yisrael and serve Hashem with all my heart and my soul. Every single thing has its ramifications. He mentioned that who was who was Zimri? He was really from the tribe of Shimon. He was there in the story of Shechem and Dina. Now we know that Shimon and Levi wipe out all the people of Shechem. How, what happened? He insisted, they insisted that they, all these people get Brit Milah. I would have thought these guys just did something pretty epic. They had a Brit Milah. They're now Jewish. Surely that's something that should be rewarded. Our rabbis tell us they were. Who are these 24,000 students of Biakiva? They are the 24,000. These are the Gilgul. These are the reincarnation. They end up meriting to be these great Sadiqim, the 24,000 students of Biakiva. That's a great thing. Zimri was their head. He was the one that came from Shechem. And he ends up, everything has its time and its place. Right? 24,000, 24,000. Everything fits. Again, we could spend a lot more time. Going through, if we had the psukim in front of us, fitting in all the pieces of the puzzle. Now, you might say to me, well, it's very nice. I'm not into this whole heebie-jeebie action. Right? This doesn't really do it for me. There's different elements of Kabbalah, right? In Torah, there's what's called pardes. What is pardes? Pay stands for pshat. Simple explanation. Resh is rem is. is a hint. What it says here, there's more there than what meets the eye. Right? Then there's re, uh, drush. It says one thing, but really means almost something different. Then there's Sod, right? Sod is the Kabbalistic stuff. Now, anything I heard from Rabbi Mansour, he said, if you understand it, it's not Kabbalah. <laughs> right? This is like the lowest level, watered down, simple, basic. You know, I have an uncle in Israel. He has the Yeshiva in Kubali. Right? Shuvi Nafshi, big rabbi, big Kabbalist. And he has the Yeshiva, but well, that's what they do. Most of the people are studying Kabbalah. First, they have to study the basics. Shulchan Aruch gets Michan. And he said, there's one guy. This guy is like one of the biggest Kabbalists in Israel. He says, before he got married, he signed a contract with his wife that he's only going to come home Thursday night to Motzei Shabbat. The rest of the time, he doesn't leave the Bet Midash. He just sits and he learns. Doesn't, doesn't, she's going to take care of the kids. because everything. Obviously, he's there as much. But he just sits and learns. He said, this guy is the, that Misirut Nefesh. That's what made him this huge giant of Kabbalah. If we understand that it's not Kabbalah, this is a very simple, basic level that you have this concept of reincarnations. Now, you might tell me, it doesn't really do it for me. You rabbis can make up stuff and make everything fit. So, I'll just tell you, I guess, a quick story or two. The Chafetz Chaim, he's already in his 90s, he gets up one day, and he bangs on the pulpit in Shul and says... Tonight, I want everyone to come to town. Thank you for joining. I want everyone to come to town. I'm going to be Migalis, so I'm going to reveal a secret. If the Chafez Chaim, the Gadol Ador, says he's revealing a secret, what do we assume that secret is? Mashiach. Everybody's, you know, like Yom Kippur, they're asking forgiveness, they're going to the mikvah, like, Mashiach's coming. The Chafez Chaim gets up and he says, I want to tell you the secret. Elokai neshama shenatata bi Hashem, the soul that you gave us, you created it, you formed it, you keep it in front of me. He says, and here's the secret. You're going to give us back that very same neshama. These people over here in this week's parasha, they went and they defecated themselves on the avodah zarah. What, did they, what is that showing? Why would it be that the avodah zarah of Baalpur is, you go on the avodah zarah? What are you trying to show? I don't care about anybody or anything. My own God, I use as a toilet. I don't have respect for anybody. The students of Biyakiva, why did they die? What did they do wrong? 
שלא נהגו כבוד זה לזה. They didn't respect each other. They didn't have כבוד one for another. What do we see? That lack of כבוד stay with them. The neshama that we have, zimri, excuse me, kozbi batzur, she listens to her father, kibud avayim. That stayed with her when she's the daughter of Yiftach. The lack of respect that became part of these 24,000 when they worshipped the Abodah Zarabal Pohar stayed with them a thousand years later as the students of Biyakiva. Everything, unless you work on yourself, it stays with you. So we want Mashiach to come here. We're discussing on Shabbat. I have a book in my house called Esther Rabbi. So I said to my son, who's 10 years old, Yala, let's go through some of the questions. You pick whatever questions you want. Uh, one of the questions was, is Mashiach really going to come on a white donkey? All right. If Mashiach came on a white donkey nowadays, what would you say? Something wrong with this guy. We don't ride donkeys anymore. If you pulled up to the White House, right? It's a 10 Downing Street, although it's empty right now. Right? I'm here. So we were discussing how it doesn't really mean a donkey. The chamor means chomriyut, physicality. Mashiach is going to be somebody who's overcome his physical temptations and physicality, and he rides on it. Right? There's all different questions. And one of the questions was about Gilgulim and reincarnations. And my son said, how's it going to be? Who's going to be reincarnated? None of us nowadays are newbies, right? Every one of us has been here before. So who's going to be the one that's reincarnated? Because it could be you were already here two or three or four times. So I always thought it would just be us. Because like we're the culmination, if you will. Right? We're the, we're the final tikkun. But the Reb Chaim Vital, the student of the Arizal, says, no, all of them will be reincarnated. How's that going to work? Oh, not my problem. Let Hashem sort it out. Right? <laughs> there's mitzvot, so there's different sparks. They go into each one of the reincarnations. But it stays with you. The character traits. If somebody has anger, that stays with them. If somebody's lazy, that stays with them. If somebody's cheap, that stays with them. The character traits that we see, and to some extent, the biggest flaws that we have, those are the things we need to work on most, because that's why we were sent back here. We were sent here to work on certain things. And the things that are our most glaring deficiencies, that's what we need to work on. Right. What do we see from this week's parasha? They come back. Right? The 24,000, 24,000, Rabbi Akiva, Kozbi, Zimri, Yiftach, Stoder, Izevel, everything has its time and place. If we unraveled it properly, you could, everything fits. Everything's perfect. But, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to understand everything has its ramifications. And I'm speaking to myself here. If we don't work on certain character flaws that we have, they stay with us. When Mashiach comes, you're not suddenly going to be this perfect person. You're still going to have that flaw. Whether it's laziness, whether it's narcissism, or whatever it might be. That's what we need to work on. And if we do that, then Be'ezat Hashem will be able to make sure that we have the perfect, when Mashiach comes, when there's Tchiat HaMetim. And that was one of the questions, Tchiat HaMetim has the work, resurrection. And then, according to the Gemara, only the Tzadikim was resurrected, but then... The whole world for a thousand years is empty. And then again, there's another Tchiat HaMetim. There's two Tchiat HaMetim. You want, we can discuss in another class exactly what, where, why, when. Many people find it interesting. But what's the lesson for us? We need to work on our character flaws. Because if not, they stay with us for all of, all of eternity. Meaning even the next Gilgul. Atati Lachsira. Said the Chavetz Chaim. We're going to get back the very same Nishama that we passed away with. So you want to make sure that it's pure. You want to make sure that it's been worked on. You want to make sure that it's holy. And if we do that, then Be'ezat Hashem... And we're all there together with Rabbi Akiva, with all the different Sadiqim and Sadiqot. We'll be there together, but as at the Shem, pure holy. And with Mashiach Tzikenu, we won't have to worry about the halachot of the three weeks and the nine days into Shabbat. Please God, we'll have everyone together, healthy, happy, with Mashiach Tzikenu. Amen.